Great. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I, um, it is an incredible head spin for me to, uh, to speak in Sydney. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know how many of you know, but I grew up in Toowoomba in, uh, in country Queensland. And for me, the big city was Brisbane. Yeah. And then the really, really big city was Sydney. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, a while back, I got a chance to speak in Brisbane. And I, I had the chance to speak in in, um, I don't know, New York or London or all these other places and at big conferences and everything, but there's something for me about going back and actually giving a talk in, in Brisbane after all those, all those years, which is even more terrifying than anything else that I've done to be back, to be back where I, I grew up. I think the last time I did anything in Sydney was in 1988. I think there was one talk in between. Uh, I got as a, as a kid to spend five minutes on, on the Ray Martin show in 1988. Is he still around? Is he still around? Is he still around? Okay. Well, anyway, uh, and since then, uh, to me, has, I, haven't, I haven't had the chance to talk here much. So, um, yeah, it's total, total hits me. So, uh, I'm on vacation, uh, so uh, the, the title of the talk kind of fits with, with that. Uh, I've uh, been um, spending three very solid weeks completely off the off the web and off the, off the internet altogether, and, and uh, uh, it's been fantastic to finally be back home uh, after after a long time. Anybody can find a way to start a Microsoft Research Office in uh, Sydney. I mean, okay, count me in. I'll come over. Mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll very glad to be back uh, in Sydney if I if I can. Um, cool, so uh, it's, it's not a demo heavy talk, instead I want to talk about some themes that are, you know, <coughs> some themes in language design and delivery, which is an area I've had the privilege to be working in for 15 years or so. Uh, I, I, that, um, Microsoft Research has been amazing in that way. I cannot believe I've had the good fortune to spend 15 years deciding what I do every day, more or less, uh, shaping the projects, how I, how I kind of, uh, in ways that I find uh, found interesting in the context of, of, of the company and the research group that I'm in and so on. And uh, I had the same boss for 12 years of that time, I think, all the way from pretty much the day I walked in, Luca Cardelli does something completely different. He does programming languages for biological systems, describing the, the cell, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> um, the biochemistry of the cell as uh, using programming language techniques. So not just differential equations, but actually like whole programs of how the cell evolves. And um, an amazing guy, but uh, he just does something just completely different. And there are other people in the research lab doing other other, all sorts of other very interesting things as well. We do Haskell work in the group at Microsoft Research in Cambridge, where, where I am. Uh, we did, did a lot of work on Link uh, as well, uh, Gavin Beerman and others uh, at, at our group. And uh, it's been a, an, an amazing place. And um, so uh, this, this talk is sort of summarizing a consistent theme I've found in my work, uh, which is um, which is about tensions, opposites in 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 in, uh, in, in computing uh, in different ways, and how they can pull you in different things can pull you in different directions, and how you try and find a reconciliation of those uh, of of the tensions involved in being pulled in different directions. And so the you know the starting point is that the, the disputes of computer science uh, should be struggled with. Okay. The chances to make a better, simpler, more relaxed world. Uh, now, as soon as I did this, said that in the first time I gave this talk, someone in the audience said, "What about Emacs and VI?" <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, that's true. I can't. You, can, you, you can't. Doesn't always work. You can't resolve everything. Perhaps there, there is a better world, and one of you can find the resolution, the reconciliation between those two things and the whole world will be made vastly, vastly better. But that one's not something I can, I can solve. Uh, so the, the idea that uh, we have these officers pulling in different directions and we, we find some synthesis uh, 
which is a different direction altogether, which is uh, which, which causes change and, and, and progress is, is not a new one. It's uh, people have been going on about this in Western philosophy for at least 200 years or so. And uh, some people make it the core of entire belief systems and the like. Uh, so you can take this idea of, of synthesis from thesis and antithesis a little bit too far. And this is a famous parody on, uh, on taking the idea of, of, of reconciliation uh, a little bit too far. So you take two things which are obviously in tension. You have time on the one hand, you have food on the other. And so this, this comes up with the idea of the mustard watch, or the generalization of the concept of watch. Mustard pot, it's famous as a, friend, as, a, uh, as a French, one of these French satires on their own schools of, of, of philosophy of reconciliation. Thomas Petrachek is the one who mentioned this to me. As soon as I mentioned I was giving a talk on this theme, he said, ah, you need to talk about mustard watches. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so in the talk I'll go through um, some things. So some of these will be technical and some of these will be social uh, sort of things that are pulling us in, in tension and then talk about uh, the, how we found a reconciliation or resolution from that in, uh, in, in the world of F-sharp. Uh, and through finding that reconciliation we find a path to relaxation because we just don't need to worry half as much anymore. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is something that goes right back to the very start of F sharp, which is um, F sharp started in around 2003. And uh, really, the, the core mission was to take functional programming in the OCaml style of functional programming and make it interoperate with, uh, with the world and particularly with the .NET uh, uh, framework and, and platform. Uh, as it, as it was then. So that's the starting point. And back then, it was a bad, bad world, okay? Functional languages were very isolated. They were largely non-interoperable. Uh, now, there's many reasons for non-interoperability between languages. One of them, very, very deep one, is when languages choose to use their own virtual machines. Uh, there was a whole world of interoperability standards in the industry, C calls, COM, call that XML, and they, it, it was it was a mess. It was, they were very difficult interop standards, often binary interoperability standards, it, and, and there could be big dominant trends in industry where you know, how many people here for how many people here is call a part of your working life at the moment? One. Every talk I come to. One. <laughs> are, you, are you the same guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so one. Okay, good. This one. Um, so, and XML, big bandwagon in the industry. It's got to, got to lots of good, good sides to it. Uh, a sufficiently big bandwagon that the, the, v, the Visual Basic language designers actually put XML support directly into the, the language. How many people have used? I even uh, wait a minute, it's okay. Uh, anyway, VB Visual Basic has XML literal support, and it's quite it's good. Uh, Scala. But, but Scala as well. Scala does XML specifically. Okay, okay, that's well. right. Yeah. Uh, so, so things then went through a huge change in the industry. And the F sharp approach, which is also the approach shared by Scala and Swift, and, and um, in particular, and, and a range of other uh, languages, is to embrace industry standard runtime layers, the virtual machines, but also try and influence them. Uh, there's a tension you get into immediately, which is about how much you embrace the the, the particular ecosystem, or think it was an exosystem that you're integrating with as you move, uh, move as you design a, uh, a new language. Uh, if you look at Scala and its relationship with the Java eco exosystem and the uh, Scala and its relationship with the JVM, F sharp and its relationship with .NET. And perhaps more, most interesting, uh, interestingly recently is to see this theme played out again in, in the arrival of Swift and its relation to the iOS uh, e uh, e e ecosystem and the Objective-C runtime layer. 
so, but the, the common theme in all these languages is, is to design them with end-to-end -end interop in mind. They do make compromises where needed. Uh, and um, it, I mean, it's particularly interesting to look at Swift, I think, with regard to how close it is to the to the to, to its immediate exosystem. In I, I looking at it, I think it's a little bit too close into the to the Objective C runtime layer. There's quite a lot of factors in the design of Swift which uh, are directly related to the Objective C runtime layer, which is not really an industry standard runtime layer. It's used in one particular environment, and that's. And once you make these decisions, they play out for years and years ahead of time. Uh, you know, the, the, the F-sharp decision to be quite closely related to .NET initially, uh, and, and probably until the last few years, looked, you know, suspect in a way, but initially, it was too close. But with the opening of .NET as an open source runtime layer, uh, and the, you know, the, the Xamarin efforts to bring .NET across a very broad range of platforms, and we'll only see that increase now that .NET is fully open source under an Apache uh, or, or under a very general license. Um, I'm actually very happy with that decision now, because we have a very broad supported runtime uh, environment. Okay, so that resolution of functional and interoperability has been a, a, a wonderful source of relaxation. It's just you, when, when I go back to communities uh, which don't, haven't achieved that, let's say Haskell and OCaml, I look at their mailing lists, I look at the sheer volume, they're great languages, absolutely great languages, they're very dear to me, both of them. <laughs> but I look at the mailing lists and the discussions, they're about Unicode libraries or something like that. And I think, oh, I didn't need to ever worry about that with F-sharp. The F-sharp community just never have those discussions or networking libraries. or so just a whole range of things is that we, uh, get for, 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 for free by being so interoperable uh, while staying true to functional programming principles. It also, in a sense, was a starting point of a journey of research for me with F-sharp type providers, and that, that raises, which raises it, the notion of interoperability to a completely different level. I'll only talk briefly about that later. I think Troy and others have been giving good overviews for uh, F-sharp type providers here at the user group. Uh, and uh, yeah. talks on that thing, uh, uh, and um, so I won't, I won't touch. I'll only touch on that a bit later. So some tensions definitely do remain. Not all functional programming techniques are easily implemented on industry standard virtual machines. We did what we could in the design of .NET, uh, in the design of .NET generics in particular, and also uh, other like tail calls uh, in, in .NET and structs uh, in. in, in, in uh, in, in, in .NET as well, all of which are crucially important to, to F-sharp performance and functional programming kind of uh, patterns. Uh, on, on, the, on JVM, for instance, with Scala, uh, you, you get tensions between sort of generics or, or even with, with Java, you get tensions between generics and boxing and so on. Some other things aren't so easily implemented on .NET. Uh, there's functional programming features like higher kind of type parameters or other things from Haskell, which don't fit so perfectly, but at its core, uh, the, the what was people initially in the functional programming world, perhaps you don't feel it now, uh, but they they were skeptical about this using these virtual machines at all. Okay, and I think that by choosing, you know, the, the world was going one way, functional VMs, and another way with like object oriented VMs. And finally, a reconciliation between those and choosing a different path for, Scott, for the, all of the three languages I've mentioned, Scala, Swift, and, and F Sharp, has been immensely productive and successful. And the whole basis for a sea change in, in, in programming, uh, bringing functional programming to industry and industry to functional programming. Okay, so for the second one, I want to talk about a much more social community or human theme, uh, which is a, a tension which it's, it plays out in all over the computer industry. Almost every one of us probably feel this tension in some way in some part of our working life. Okay, uh, and yeah, the tension is simple as like, do I do a startup or do I make an open source library? You know, kind of <laughs> which would I do today? If I don't have a day off. Which way do I go? Uh, or a year off, or, or uh, and so on. 
But it, but it plays out in many other different ways. And I want to talk about the enterprise and openness tension uh, from the F sharp perspective. Uh, so one, one way to do that is simply to summarize where F sharp is today. Uh, so first of all, F sharp as a language uh, is open, it's cross-platform, and it's independent. Uh, so those, we can dig in to what we mean by all of those, and in fact, the, the rest of the, the, the points uh, bring that out. But I think there was a sense, because F Sharp grew up at Microsoft Research, and, uh, the, and the Visual Studio team made Visual F Sharp as a set of tools for F Sharp inside Visual Studio, there was a sense for a long time that F Sharp wasn't independent of Microsoft. And F Sharp is, as a language, independent of Microsoft today. But Microsoft may contribute to it. And, and so I, I, the way I like to think of it is something that's like Python. Uh, F Sharp is independent in the same way that Python is independent. We don't really mind where Guido's working. Okay? There, there are lots of different companies contribute to Python. Uh, Guido well, used to work for Google. I think he works for a different company now. Uh, and uh, Microsoft are very happy contributors to open source to open languages and, uh, and uh, uh, cross-platform languages where you contribute. Um, you, you, you can see that in very similar TypeScript is in, in a sense in a very similar situation. Uh, but but um, we contribute to a huge range of open, uh, open uh, projects and languages and frameworks. So the F-Sharp language accepts contributions, which is a wonderful thing. And that doesn't sound uh, very remarkable by industry standards today. It's totally normal for an open and independent language to do that. But it's taken us a long time to get there socially. And uh, it's, but of course, it's the right thing to be doing. All the last, the, 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 the next version of F-Sharp, F-Sharp 4.0, contains, I think, I'll mention this in a later slide, over 120 contributions from uh, right across the F-Sharp community. Uh, and write a, from a range of different companies and, and, um, and individuals, myself included, uh, and Marcus, other people at Microsoft included. Uh, so, at the at core, at the core of sort of making this a social reality is the establishment of the F Sharp Software Foundation, which I kind of. You know, there's the language and there's industry supported tooling like Visual F Sharp and, there, and then there's a great community organization. And these are like three legs uh, which you, you're, you, have to, you have to have all of them to your, your chair your stool, to, to be stable. Yeah. And if you, it's, it's imbalanced if you only have two of those or, or, or one of those. And the F Sharp Software Foundation is an absolutely fantastic thing. The, um, uh, I mean, it's already been mentioned a bit today. This is the, the website of fsharp.org. You can um, find so fundamental. You find out a lot about fsharps on this website. Part of the fundamental mission of the the the, the 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 software foundation is to be a voice for fsharp. It's a little bit different to the Apache Software Foundation or the dot, there is a .NET Software Foundation, both of which are sort of open source IP holders in a way that kind of, uh, but in, in the, the, the thing about the F-Sharp Software Foundation it really is a community uh, foundation to be a strong voice for the technology and, uh, and a neutral, fair voice, not biased by any one particular company or any uh, the other companies that are, 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 are members of the, org, of the foundation, but it's a very fair, neutral, strong voice for, for, the, for the language and for the people who are using the language. You can go and find out the mission statement of the foundation. You can also join, join the foundation. The foundation is now a legal entity, a non-profit uh, corporation in the United States, as it had always planned to be. And that's been a lot of work by people in the, in the foundation. And it's wonderful to have the guy, you know, guys here in Sydney uh, being part of uh, this organization. And, um, and contributing to it. <coughs> okay, so that's fsharp.org. Uh, so on the tooling side, we have Xamarin providing fsharp tooling for Android and iOS. So you can go and get Xamarin Studio today. It has fsharp support built in. It's got uh, tooling for Android and iOS. And uh, you can also do Mac and Linux programming there and Windows programming as well, but they focus on Android and iOS. 
The Visual F Sharp tools are from Microsoft. They're professional tools for Windows and Azure platforms. And we have Debian and other packages for Linux as well. So we have a good broad spectrum uh, across the, the platform ranges. <laughs> At the heart of uh, a lot of transformations are in, in F Sharp recently is that the technical core of it is a, a thing called the F Sharp compiler service. And I'll just bring up <coughs> the website for that. Okay, so this is a this is a DLL. It's a single component. Okay, uh, it's just one file. It's all fully open source. It's the, the compiler. Uh, it's the logic that makes up F Sharp as a programming language, delivered as a single component, which you can integrate into all sorts of other things and use in all sorts of other other ways. So you can see the services that are here. You have representations of the syntax trees of the editor services for doing. Uh, the nice IntelliSense and everything you get with tooling in F-Sharp and then there's a, a range of other services as well. But perhaps more interesting is a set of projects that actually use the compiler service. And this is new this year, okay? And this is really uh, at the heart of sort of getting F-Sharp to no longer just be a Microsoft tooling thing from a tooling point of view, but letting it run free and be used in all sorts of other places and other ways. So you can see here that there are there are Visual F Sharp uh, extra tools based on these compiler services. Uh, the Xamarin tools use it. The Emacs plugin for F Sharp uses it. The Vim plugin. We have an IPython notebook uh, engine for F Sharp, and you can see down down the list down here. Um, you can you run through pretty much any of these, and they're all pretty they're, they're actually quite interesting. So let's take a look at um, Tsunami, uh, for example. Actually, that's F cell. Uh, F cell is a set of uh, it is a set of editing tools by which host F sharp code alongside Excel and kind of integrate F sharp and Excel together. So you can use Excel as the, as a, the code behind programming language for Excel for, uh, for for Excel. Use F sharp as a code behind language for, for Excel workbooks. Uh, there's another uh, fantastic version of this, which is where F Sharp is integrated into a 3D CAD editor called Rhino. Okay, uh, how many people have heard of AutoCAD? Okay. How many have heard of Rhino? Okay, are you an architect? Do you have architect friends? Okay. Okay. The, 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 all the, it seems that a lot of young architects, in particular, tend to be using Rhino instead of AutoCAD. That's my impression from talking to some of the people involved in this. Uh, and uh, so this is, this is so you bet from from a if you know AutoCAD you can imagine F Sharp and AutoCAD being integrated together, and that's been used to um, help design some wonderful buildings around the world. That, that combination, including the, the Louvre Museum in Abu Dhabi, the roof on that museum, uh, there, there's a second Louvre to be opened in Abu Dhabi, and its roof is the, the 3D geometry is done using F Sharp programming combined with Rhino by an engineering company in, um, in Austria. Now you can actually learn about that testimonial and others at the fsharp.org testimonials. Uh, you can take a scroll down here and somewhere down here we'll see this one here is that particular testimonial of the picture of that, that museum. So integrating fsharp code with in interesting, empowering situations, whether that be Excel, whether that be 3D CAD environments, uh, coming back to uh, the, the list here, you can another here's another example of using uh, the F Sharp compiler services. We can let's take a look at. This one here. That's actually Troy. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is uh, this is literate programming using F Sharp. So this the source to this set of slides is actually an F Sharp script, and then you press a button, 
and out comes a set of uh, reveal.js slides, which integrates the code and the slides just based on the markdown. You've got markdown being turned into slides with code integrated into the slides uh, here. So that, that means, uh, I'm not sure what, yeah, okay, that's working. That means as you're, as you're working with the code in the, in the slides and presenting, you get some IntelliSense and tooltips being, being displayed as well. So it knows about the code because the tools that are processing the code have used the F-sharp compiler services to, to work with the code mm -hmm. as well. Okay, so let's is it back. Okay, so that's FS Reveal. And uh, there are other, all sorts of other tooling being built, including integrating F Sharp into gaming engines. There's two examples of that, only one of them are listed here. This is, uh, so you're using F Sharp as sort of a uh, Lua replacement. So you, you're, you've got a script which is your, your extra code which is configuring the game, uh, the, the game environment. Okay, so that, so that is, okay. So that, as I said, the F-Sharp compiler services is, is at the heart, technically, of empowering a range of tooling experiences. Uh, at a community level, the F-Sharp community is very self-empowered, and that <coughs> is a really great thing. I'm, I, I, I'm a big fan of communities building tooling that they use themselves. And uh, that's why I built F-Sharp, was to have a programming language that I wanted to use. Uh, when at, at Microsoft to combine what I loved about OCaml programming and to make that uh, to bring that into a, into a different in, environment which I which I need to use and uh, now all of this uh, this kind of set of changes in F, in F sharp in a way have allowed me to get back to my core job which is designing F sharp 4.0 uh, and uh, that is now well and truly underway. Uh, in fact, we, these slides are from Decem December, and during December we really locked down on the development process for F Sharp 4.0. You can still contribute if you like by code reviewing things, by doing some testing, uh, getting the early releases as they come out, uh, you know, and, and helping also to integrate F Sharp into, uh, into these, like working on Linux packages and so on. There's all sorts of ways to contribute. So in one year, we've definitely come a long way. Uh, we've had the F-Sharp Software Foundation, we've had all this IDE tooling, we've had a great ecosystem, embrace, you know, embrace an open ecosystem for F-Sharp, uh, good cross-platform story. I can't believe what a strong mobile programming story F-Sharp has, has developed in the last year and a half. And uh, okay, and now in 2014, we do open engineering on all of F-Sharp and the visual F-Sharp tools. And F Sharp is still packaged in Visual Studio as an enterprise supported product. So that means, and it's also packaged in Xamarin Studio as a supported product. So uh, the con if you contribute to F Sharp, your code will be taken by these companies and it does get packaged and shipped with products, but those companies are also contributing back to F Sharp in lots of ways. Okay, lots of pull requests to the F Sharp compiler. If you want to contribute, you can go to see the guides on F Sharp.github.io. Okay. This slide is going to be too small, uh, so I will hand wave a, a bit here and, and run you through quickly. I just want to quickly explain how uh, technical contributions to F-Sharp actually flow through. So this is github.com, that is slash F-Sharp, uh, and the F-Sharp compiler service. We actually ask at the moment that you contribute via another site called visualfsharp.coplex.com and you contribute into there. They're basically the same repositories. Uh, there's very slight differences. Uh, this one here has more open source, uh, so there are more cross-platform GIFs uh, changes in it. Just a few changes which haven't yet been folded back. But over time, we expect to see these merge into one on GitHub. Uh, now, the reason why we ask you to contribute here, okay, is that this is what Microsoft package and ship as a visual F sharp tools for Windows. And that means they're doing full QA, full Microsoft Enterprise QA over the core of the F sharp compiler on all sorts of different platforms and configurations and all sorts of different bells and whistles and a whole lot of different stuff. And we see from the community perspective, we see that as a contribution that Microsoft make to F sharp uh, and to maintaining the core quality of it. And uh, uh, Xamarin do similar QA 
and a job on their packaging for Linux and uh, iOS and others. Uh, this stuff here becomes a set of NuGet packages. NuGet is the packaging system that a lot of people use in, in .NET land. And uh, that, there's a cross-platform components that can be used on, um, the f -sharp compiler service components can be used on uh, you know, a range of different platforms. And they go into, so as I said, the compiler service is what builds most of the other tooling around about. It builds open editing tools and em Emacs releases and Debian releases come out of there. And then we have some uh, Xamarin tooling gets taken out of there. Okay, so as for your, your these, these repositories all have a Git relationship with its flow that changes down, integrate, integrate. And so the change coming in here in a matter of half an hour or something can be pushed to all the different, uh, once it's, the QA process is done, it can be pushed to all the different packages. We get the NuGet packages coming out and when, and when these tools cho choose to pick up the next version of the NuGet packages, the F sharp flows out, updates the F sharp flow out into the wider world. Okay, so as I said, that's let me concentrate on the F sharp language design. Sorry, I'm, I'm using a different laptop here. Let's try and open this. Uh, and we, we manage the F sharp language design through the F sharp language design user voice. So if you have suggestions for the F sharp language itself, not the tooling, I'm just interested in the language design itself. That's my job then you can come along and you can make suggestions here. I notice there's already another 10 suggestions while I've been on vacation. <laughs> so that'll be my job to go over those. And uh, you see some of them are marked as completed with regard to F-sharp 4.0. And you can see there's a range of different discussions going on and comments and so on. And you can go and contribute to those discussions. And this is what I, the source information I used to help guide the language design. I contribute to the site as well but I want to show things in particular directions. Uh, okay, so that's the language design process. I've talked about the F-sharp compiler service already. So overall, the situation we're in is one which uh, I'm really incredibly happy with. We have an enterprise quality tooling for F-sharp on some crucial platforms. We have a full openness story and we have community great community uh, story, a foundation for the language uh, to look after, uh, being the voice for the language, and, uh, <coughs> and uh, a good ecosystem and an evolution path for the language going forward. And getting this combination, uh, it's, it's, it's been a lot of work, it's been really, really exciting to be part of this, and I've learned so much about the social processes. I'm actually really glad that we made this shift to be to, to this combination uh, in 2012, 2013, because those are the days of things like GitHub and Twitter. We built this wonderful worldwide community. Uh, um, Twitter is at the, the, the core of, of enabling communication in that community. And um, if I think if we'd actually done this in 2006, 2007, we'd probably you know, we'd been a source forge or something. And then we'd we'll be digging ourselves out of that, you know. So that's how this happens. Okay. Okay. So I want to get back to a couple of other technical um, tensions. Uh, so that was the social stuff uh, done, and the next thing I want to talk, talk about is the tension, technical tension between functional programming and object-oriented programming. Uh, so in two thousand and three and before, functional this is. Fun Functional languages have historically been very anti oh okay? Uh, and um, even today, it surprises me that it, when you talk to some Haskell people, I understand where they're coming from. Uh, but uh, you can get the, you can mention the object word and you get this really quite strong re reaction. And um, that's, I, I as I said, I understand where it's coming from. One particularly funny, uh, Manifestation of that. How many people do people know the book Modern Compiler Implementation with Standard ML? Is that all with Java? It's the same book, uh, just with different language. You know the book. Okay, take a look at chapter 14. Yeah, uh, because they, uh, all the way through, every chapter title has a every, every chapter has a title and then a little subtitle all the way through. All of them are as dry as toast. 
straight up definitions of everything, of things, all the way through, except for this one, right? <laughs> which is the whole reason for putting those things in was to be able to put that in, in the book. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that, that, I thought that was very, very clever by uh, it. Okay, so this is how F sharp and objects look in F sharp. You haven't seen much F sharp code, but this is a type. This is a constructor. In my, this is the uh, contents of the class. This let thing here can be a range of functional programming constructs. There's a lot of let bindings only in F sharp. And then this is the members, which are the interface to the to the objects. So the grand you can also have static members in there. So you have inputs, to object construction, object internals, exported properties, and exported method. So that's all nice. The object oriented programming in F sharp is really sweet. Works well with type inference. You can see the type inference is going to be used here. Occasionally, here you might need extra type annotations that's to, to pin down the arithmetic that's being used here. These are the actual constructs. We have constructed class types here. You recognize that layout from the previous slide. You can have mutable statement objects there. Uh, object interfaces are there and object expressions are there. Interestingly, C sharp doesn't have object expressions, which kind of like in a class is just less complex. Uh, uh, so C sharp doesn't have those today. But with F sharp, that's where we started with object oriented programming. The very first feature we put in wasn't types or members or anything like that. It was just the ability to blend object or object programming with expression-oriented programming, because expression-oriented programming is what makes functional programming so powerful, and therefore with closure and capture and all the other nice things that come. And then we kind of eventually completed all the other, uh, the other constructs. So the F-sharp approach, you can see that from the history, is to embrace objects and make them fit with the expression-oriented type functional paradigm and we're especially embracing them for interop and software engineering purposes. So we often use the term object programming instead of object oriented programming. Okay. F sharp is not really object oriented, it's just object. We just have object programming as one of the things we can do with F sharp. Okay, you see. Yeah. So one way of looking at this is a lot of micro work that goes on in getting a a reconciliation between these two paradigms which we're heading off in is the different directions. <coughs> Yeah, functional programming features at the top here and object oriented programming features down the left. And not all of these ticks make sense. So there are a couple, if you pin me down on them and say, what do you mean by that? Is there any actual work in making those things combine? I say, no, okay, that one is more like a zero. But uh, there, uh, for most of these, there's actually some technical work. I can point you some lines in the F sharp compiler or some parts in the F sharp language design. So that's how we find a reconciliation between those two things. So let's say, for example, the idea of uh, non-nullness. Uh, <coughs> okay, that's a very a thing that so the no no nulls or uh, well, the, the the default in F sharp code is that things cannot be null. Um, so uh, so okay. So <coughs> I talked about the combination of expression-oriented programming and uh, object types and some object expressions. We have closure and capture, we saw that before in the construction syntax, how closure and capture work with object types. Let's take first class <coughs> values. Uh, so in, uh, in F sharp there are various things which can be first class values, for instance a void or a unit value. This, the fact that void is not actually a value in C sharp causes a lot of pain in the design of C sharp libraries. You have task and you have task of T. The task is the one returning void. You get kind of just that one little thing causes a, a duplication of the world all the way through a whole stack, yeah, framework after framework has to duplicate things out because of that. They didn't get a resolution between that tension there. I put it in the spec of C sharp generics, right, to find a resolution between those two things to allow void to be valued. But they said, no, nah, that's too hard. So, but then what they're doing, pushing, <laughs> pushing off pain to other, to other people, to framework builders. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there are some places where we don't get a full resolution. So the, one of the functional things, things that people love about functional programming languages is the semi milner type inference. And uh, that is, 
is uh, so. It's sort of the way a shop works is that as, if you don't use object-oriented features, then you get Hingley Miller type inference. But as the more and more object-oriented features you use, the less and less of that you get, and you, you have to add more type annotation. Okay. Uh, so um, yeah, that's that's how we get the resolution. Another feature that functional programming people love is currying, a very convenient way of generating new function values out of, out of existing functions. Uh, and we actually ban the combination of Carrying and method overloading which just doesn't work very well together. And so that's, we don't, we didn't try to find a productive resolution between those. So relatively graceful degradation in some parts and uh, some combinations are outlawed for sanity or... <laughs> okay. Did anyone request it? What's that? You should just ban method overloading. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. No. There, yeah. There's. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. We ban. <laughs> I'm not going to get there. Go there. I'm going to say we're going to ban current. You can use non-null values with method overload. You can use more. Uh, yeah. We work hard to make more flags with the same as tuples. We close and capture, etc. Yes. Okay. Right. So a functional first approach, which still supports interoperability and. Uh, uh, um, and, and, and object programming makes a huge difference in practice. You saw some of the testimonials before, and I'd encourage you to go and read those. Uh, one case study I like to point out is this one, which is by uh, someone working for an energy company in the UK. Maybe it's part of a team there. And it's a, they basically re-implemented, or did at the same time as an offshore team was doing an implementation of of, a, of an engine, a market, there's an engine which had to respond to the market signals about the energy market in Europe, and then more or less it make a decision about whether to turn power stations on or off, as, as far as I understand what, what the purpose of that thing was. So we see that, that there's lots of energy being dumped in, onto the, the market then, and that would be, they could buy that from France, and that was going to happen in, 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 in in one hour's time, and that's enough time to turn the power station off or something like that. Like, do, 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 do. Um, there's some funny stories about that application. One is one is that the Finns didn't pu only publish their data as a website, and they actually had to go and screen scrape to use optical character recognition yeah. on the actual data to try and you know, to extract the data to feed into their engine. Crazy what people have to program, but. Uh, uh, okay, but this was done both by C-Sharp offshore team and, and, and they also did it in F-Sharp in the UK. And um, a C-Sharp project took five years, picked the eight developers, didn't fully implement all the contracts. F-Sharp project took a year and picked the three devs, only one had prior experience with F-Sharp, all the contracts fully implemented. Uh, there are, now, I think it's important to realize this is not only a difference in language, but a difference in paradigm as well, and also a difference in post uh, programming. And, uh, perhaps a difference in, in, in cultural programming and quality, program quality as well, I'm not sure. But it's a pretty interesting comparison point. So the original post was called by Simon, where he explains this, it's a tiny link down the bottom. Does the language you use make a difference? Revisit it. He actually retitled that to be Does the paradigm you use make a difference? Just to make it a little bit less about the language. Okay. Uh, so, but the comparison here, our line count here, you see braces, 56,000 of them in C sharp. Uh, see the null check difference here coming out. Uh, lots and lots of comments there. Um, it's interesting. Uh, useful. Uh, yeah, useful. <laughs> um, there's the test code. I'm very glad to, sorry, glad to see that the test uh, code ratio for a sharp is actually higher than the test code, okay, code ratio for C sharp. I think that you know, shows that they're doing good testing for F sharp. We're not trying to say that we skimp on testing. Uh, okay, um, but perhaps the most interesting statistic of all was this one, which is the word under there is try, try, try with or try catch statements. Okay, so the C sharp <coughs> two thousand try catch statements. Okay, which to me says that they've lost control of the complexity of their application. 
And in particular, I know it was a reactive application and that they were getting. It might be a lot better with C sharp async, well used, possibly, uh, because I think they were getting a lot of exceptions in callbacks and then catching exceptions and having nowhere to send the exception to, and then mm. something else would go wrong later. And then sooner or later, you get so paranoid that every single commit you make, you add a try and catch around the thing uh, just in case, and then yeah, you're in hell. Uh, okay. Um, and Simon's very proud of having zero bugs in deployed systems. He's going to be terribly shattered when he actually gets a bug in one of his <laughs> deployed systems. F sharp, of course, doesn't always have this property, but I, I think Simon's methodology that he uses is really, really strong as a, uh, as a team. And he, he's, he's at the point where he says F sharp is a safe choice for the projects they do, and they any other choice is too risky. Again, it's also about paradigm and about teams and a whole lot of other testing methodology, a whole lot of other things as well. For him, those things come together in, in F-sharping and an enabling tool for a lot of those, those things. So he's pushing, yeah, he makes that point very convincing. So functional and objects. Uh, so we have pretty positive synthesis in, in F-sharp. There's some limitations remain, I mentioned those. But I, there's one thing I think it's really worth discussing uh, in, this, in this context, it's because it's a place where, in a sense, we haven't found a reconciliation in F-sharp. And people notice it, definitely. And, it's, uh, and so it's worth taking a good look at it. And that's about circularities and modularity in the big picture of code. So mix of, the, the kind of approach we're talking about, mix of functional paradigm stuff is one, absolutely. Yeah, Lambdas and C-sharp and Java. Async is a sort of functional programming thing in, in C sharp, so it's link, you see the async stuff going through JavaScript, function types in C sharp, generics in C sharp, Java, generics in Visual Basic, you know, great. Okay, <laughs> but it hasn't won everywhere. Okay, it says one is in methodologies, you see and still see plenty of very, very heavy inheritance based methodologies, uh, too much so. Then you see nulls uh, everywhere in C sharp code or in OO code. Um, and you also see circularities everywhere. Uh, so intrinsically, we all believe as, as, as computer programmers that un unnecessary, unnecessary circularities are not a good thing. It's kind of functional programmers have this quite strong in their blood, you know, that uh, they like their programs to be properly constructed, layered, layered uh, to reduce cyclic dependencies. The C sharp approach is that all files in an assembly are mutually referential. You can have arbitrary circularity and dependency between internal items in an assembly, to any, pretty much any type. You can do internal visible to to really reveal the contents of one assembly to another, and you can even do mutually recursive, mutually referential assemblies if you try hard. And uh, people, people at Microsoft know all the tricks and they do it. They make these things. The F sharp uh, approach to circularity is very different. So F sharp has a file ordering. Uh, it's like Haskell and all Hindi Milner languages. So we prohibit direct circularities across files. It's quite a strict uh, approach. Uh, we encourage minimizing dependencies within a file. You see, let, let, let each one is just referring to the things that have been defined before. And you're constructing a world which is well well constructed from it, from the previous definitions that you have. You, you can make things uh, recursive, mutually referential or recurs recursive, but in general you try, you, you find yourself avoiding that. You use parameterization much more. And f -sharp objects do support some limited forms of circularity. And when you do an object-oriented bit of code in f -sharp, like the one I showed before, you can do circular references. When you move, the more you move towards object programming, the more you can do circular things. Okay, so uh, this is an analysis done by a guy called Scott Wallachian in the F Sharp community. Uh, and um, so let's analyze some C Sharp and F Sharp projects. There's a bunch of C Sharp projects and there's a bunch of F Sharp projects. And you can read, if you're interested in the selection of projects, you can read Scott's, blog, Scott's blogs about this in more detail. Uh, and so let's first look at the number of top-level dependencies. Now the top-level dependencies here is like dependencies 
between one module or type or class, you have the top level components and other top level components. So you can see that in this in a, my original C sharp projects, there's uh, a sort of the total number of dependencies plotted against code size here. The code size is measured not is measured according to IL measured according to intermediate code. Okay, to try and balance out the differences with like type inference and so on in the languages. Okay, so the C sharp code definitely seems to have a different profile in terms of total number of dependencies. And that comes out quite nicely in this figure as well, which is what are the, how many F sharp top level types or modules have no dependencies at all? Like half of them have no dependencies at all. And they're really nice because that means you can retake them and reuse them in another setting without, without even, yeah, they're lovely, lovely bits of code, right? Friendly, not very happy. Uh, over here in C-Chart, we've got some of those, 30%, but you can see that there are some which have 10 or more dependencies, whereas like 10 or more dependencies are only 2% here. This is the details. Uh, I'll come back to this, actually. So what we want to talk about is a, a cycle count. Well, let's look at some dependency graphs, first of all. This is spec flow, a testing framework done in C-Sharp. And this is tick flow done in F sharp. Yeah. <laughs> so that looks generally promising. And let's talk about circularity. So actually, I'll look at some of the raw it? figures here. The spec flow one is in the floor. It's actually in the floor. Yeah, the spec flow one would go off the bottom here a bit. Probably another screen for it. Yeah. Um, so let's look at the C-sharp code and let's look at the cycle counts. Okay, so in Entity Framework, there are 14 cycles. 24% of things participate in a cycle. And there are cycles of 79 bit, 79 components involved in, in that cycle. Okay. And you see the maximum component size, Cecil, is 123 here. But there's only one cycle. So that probably means, well, it is just all one bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, that, maybe that's easier than kind of having sort of cycles within another cycle. Uh, and you, know, you can see this, the cycle counts in C sharp code are pretty high. And then you can look at the F sharp code here for cycle counts, and there's just an awful lot of zeros here. In fact, I mean, two things here have a significant cycle at all. And uh, that's in the and then that's in the internal one, and then that's in the public facing with no cycles in the public facing view of the work half of those. Let's take a look at that here. You can see the C sharp cycle counts here against code size and then the F sharp ones down here. Okay, so in C sharp there's nothing stopping you from creating cycles. You have to make a really special effort to avoid them. In F sharp you can't easily that easily create cycles at all. Okay, just to show you how horrific <laughs> this gets, this is Microsoft Entity Framework. Uh, and this is one eighth or one twelfth of the overall diagram for dependency diagram for that particular framework. Uh, uh, people, I'm sure people, people definitely use Entity Framework productively for all sorts of things. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very widely used framework with great documentation and sort of snippet based programming for getting, getting stuff done. So it's a, it's, it's you can get a lot of stuff done, but I wouldn't like to have to work on this software, on the internals of this, of this software. So in theory and in practice, uh, unmoderated intracomponent cycles, I, I do believe evidence is mounting that they are actually a disaster. Okay, you, we're in this unfortunate position that it's either fully unmoderated cycles or we have this sort of F-sharp much stricter approach. F-sharp gives good results by adopting a stricter approach, <coughs> but it's, uh, uh, there are times when you do, do you, know, you do notice it in the language that you have to think about the dependency structure and maybe put a bit more work into that, into that. but it, it gives very good results. I do believe language mechanisms that enforce or encourage acyclicity are good and C Sharp would benefit from such a mechanism as with a Java and Scala and a whole bunch of other languages. Okay. How much more time do I have? Not much. Not much. Not much. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, 
Okay, good. So that's that's what I want to say about that, functional and objects. Uh, the the next area is pattern matching and abstraction. Again, so F sharp is one of these type functional language, languages with this wonderful feature called pattern matching in the code, where you can take. Um, well, I'll talk about that. Okay. So the problem is that pattern matching is in strong tension with abstraction. So let, let's take a look at this. Patterns in F sharp are absolutely everywhere. Whether you do a let binding or a function, a lambda value here, where you define a function here, you can have multiple patterns for a code function. Most obviously in this match construct, you match an expression with a range of different patterns, goes through a test against them all, extracts some values out and continues on on one of the right hand sides. Uh, you can use it when catching exceptions. You try with some expression, you do a width, there's a range of different patterns to catch, ex uh, catch exceptions, so check the exception. You also do it when you have these comprehensions, uh, the sequence expressions here. Um, so patterns are absolutely everywhere here. Even in the object-oriented code, you can have patterns here as these argument expressions if you really want, or up here as well, in class definitions. So that's all, that's all nice. So pattern matching is a really lovely feature in, in, in programming languages. It's like a switch statement on, on steroids, but it's, it's so, it's, it simplifies so many things in, in, in coding. You, know, the, the, you take some inputs and you decompose it according to a number of possibilities and continue on on those different paths. The problem is that it, you, in most functional languages, including some of the pseudo-functional languages like Swift, which are emerging, there's no uh, there's no way to name these patterns. So if you if you find a pattern re recurring, you know, all over your code, you can't name it and abstract it. And 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 and, and yeah, that's that, that's fundamentally wrong, right? You know, we know that you should be able to name and abstract things. Uh, now it also um, so you can't name things. You can't. Parameterized patterns. Okay, so you sometimes you want a pattern to match on uh, on on, on, on char A characters and sometimes on B characters. And wouldn't it be nice if that kind of could be parameterized on that? Uh, and they also trap. Perhaps most crucially in some functional languages, patterns can only match on the <coughs> concrete representation of the of the type of thing coming in. So if you have a list coming in, you can match on nil or cons, because a list is like either nil or cons. Um, or if you have a, uh, uh, a date time object coming in, well, you can only, well, only match on well, what the representation of that is according to seconds, minutes, years, or something like that. But that might not be what you want to do. Okay? You might want a different view over date times and match on a different categorization. So, um, so if the, the, in practice, this is a really big problem. I've seen some OCaml code bases, okay, with patterns like pages long, okay. You don't know what the heck you're matching, okay, and you're matching on the internals of objects, which you shouldn't be doing. Uh, and people who should know better use this feature again and again, and they don't, and it's like it's, it's totally wrong. So patterns are also incredibly bad. So no pattern match on abstract types. They encourage people to break abstraction boundaries and they're not extensible. Only one view of a type is allowed. So, enter F sharp active patterns. It's a very similar feature to Scala extractors. They're done basically at the same time. And actually, in a loose cooperation where, um, with me visiting EPFL and, and vice versa with Martin Podeski at Microsoft Research. So uh, this is one example of this. It's, uh, the double ticks aren't necessary. So I actually might try and find a different example. Okay, the double ticks aren't necessary here. So uh, they're, they're necessary because the identifiers have a space in it. So you should treat this as one identifier. So this is defining a new pattern parameterized by an n, which uh, no, which uh, analyzing the input n. Categorizing it into either an even number or an odd number. You could do the same thing with date times to use the same example before. You take a date times and input, and you could categorize it as like uh, in, into into a finite number of different categories, uh, like 80, 
increases or something like that. Um, and then once, once you match on the input, you can choose which one you're going to use here. And you're going to match and use this active pattern to categorize the input in, in a way that is new for this particular data type of integers. Okay, so that's, uh, that's how you make pattern matching extensible and uh, abstract. So, uh, so for example, when you, if you look in the F sharp compiler service, you have this thing called F sharp expression, and you see lots and lots of patterns to match F sharp expression in different ways. So the theme that comes out here is that whenever you have this sort of very heterogeneous data, like F sharp expression or strings or integers or XML data or um, or byte streams, then you probably because it's so heterogeneous, it can represent so many different things that it's really very useful to start to define a collection of active patterns to categorize various chunks out of that space of data. So that's how you define the active patterns. And this might be how you define, the same thing can apply in F sharp, you have some F sharp code here to work with C sharp syntax trees here. This comes from a component called Roslyn for C sharp syntax trees. And we're just defining some active patterns to identify various kinds of C-sharp syntax nodes, whether they're you know, doing different things and where. Underneath, this is an object-oriented type. It's got an abstract interface of some kind. We don't care about that. What we care about is that we're able to use functional programming thinking of categorizing things in our F-sharp F -sharp programming as we're working with those syntax trees. Uh, and so, when you're doing that kind of programming from F sharp, it turns out it's actually much easier working with those syntax trees than it is from C sharp because F sharp gives you the tools to kind of categorize and organize, organize things. Okay, so uh, the, this is just absolutely wonderful thing again. It's made out this resolution of this tension between pattern matching and abstraction drop out very nicely. And it um, means that patterns can be used in all sorts of interesting ways even more so than other functional languages. Okay, so I'm going to finish off now just by quickly mentioning some other features which are other areas of tension which, and their resolution, and I won't have time to talk about them. One of them is about code and data, totally fundamental uh, tension in, in, in programming languages. And F -sharp has this um, feature for uh, called F -sharp type providers which are about blending data into the, into the programming language. And it's, it's particularly important today because of the changes that are happening in the world. We see this sort of exponential explosion of, uh, of APIs in the open web and the sort of the richness of the information context around our programs. You, know, here, you see the figures here, up to 10,000 APIs mentioned on programmableweb.com, some of them very, some of them huge. And uh, what we want is statically typed languages which can interact with this sort of what seems like a dynamically typed world out there with all these, uh, these APIs and other information resources. And so we need to bring information to the language and I, I'll just show you the, let's see here. Okay, so here's just a CSV GIF showing an example of using an F sharp type provider to access this particular web service here. Uh, we've taken a snapshot of, of, the, of the kind of data, the CSV file data that this web service, uh, this, this REST call returns. And the key part here is that as we work with the, this stocks type, we've been given a set of this, this CSV provider has taken a sample of the data and generated a set of types that corresponds to that data. Okay. So you can generate types or typed APIs from samples of target data, whether that be data be CSV data or XML data or JSON data and other. And so by giving us a sample or by giving a small succinct schema, you can have a range of extra add-ins to the F sharp language which translate that schema and data into the F sharp type system and make it available for you to work with it in a strongly typed way. Okay. So 
F-Sharp Type Providers have been an incredibly successful feature. Uh, I'm sure they'll, fe they'll feature a lot at the user group here. And you can use them for all sorts of things, uh, just a huge range of applications. I won't go through them here. Uh, but the key thing to me is that I, as a code-oriented, strongly typed code-oriented programmer, feel like data is now my friend. External data services can now be brought in and seamlessly integrated into my worldview as a programmer uh, in, a, in a strongly typed functional programming language. Okay, so other areas which I'll skip over are synchron synchronous and asynchronous programming. Uh, you can just see the F-sharp async feature. This feature has progressed on its merry way into C-sharp and thereby into Python, it seems, and into Hack, the programming language from Facebook. And uh, is, so it's sort of quickly propagating itself around the world. F-sharp is only one node in this sort of long history of ways to, 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 to solve async programming that sort of influenced how C-sharp and other languages have been doing it. So very happy about that. Another tension is numbers and numbers with units, uh, numbers with, 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 with strong types. Uh, and again, F-sharp has a feature called units of measure. This one I'd say it's, it's great to get this combination. It's a very non-intrusive combination in features, but there's probably more general ways to do it than the way that F-sharp happened to do it. Uh, it's, it's, I'm happy with where we are. There's lots of good Haskell work and other languages exploring how to do this kind of extra annotation in programming languages. Okay, other areas, GPU and CPU. Uh, there, there are these two fantastic GPU frameworks for F-sharp. Uh, the, the, the technique that F-sharp uses is F-sharp quotations. So this allows you, as users of the language, to grab the F-sharp syntax trees and, and compile them and translate them uh, in, in whatever way we see fit. So the area we've been putting work into to allow you to also do good debugging, for instance, of GPU programs. So these frameworks here, such as Alia GPU, to also get very good debug information. You can set breakpoints in Visual Studio and other tooling to, to get good debugging of the GPU, the ultimately generated GPU code. Okay, so I've gone through a set of areas, some of them social and some of them technical. So uh, obvious questions like what's next? Uh, but in many ways, I'm not sure because I am a lot of areas of tension have been resolved and I'm able to be a lot more relaxed these days than I used to be uh, and take long holidays in Australia for a few, <laughs> or at least for a few weeks. Um, there are a couple of areas that bug me. One, and one area which I'm particularly interested in, I'm, I'm interested in this for some, you know, I work for Microsoft and Microsoft Research. And so I'm, I, you know, a big topic at Microsoft is, is cloud programming, the Azure platform. and. Uh, but there's this tension between this kind of F-sharp style of coding with this REPL kind of coding where you, you know, you're data there and playing, you know, executing code on your local machine and distributing and scaling those kind of, uh, that kind of REPL programming. And there, there are people trying to solve this in a bunch of different ways. Um, but I'm really interested in finding a solution for F-sharp to allow you to get that REPL programming experience with getting scalability and distribution at the same time. Um, without tying yourself too closely to any one cloud platform. There's a, a company called Mesos who have been doing a lot of great work in F-sharp distributed programming. Uh, one of the F-sharp advent calendar uh, entries was close to this topic. Uh, we had to use this value library uh, to, seem, to seamlessly distribute F-sharp code. That vagrant is a different thing to the vagrant people might be used to Linux, Windows thing. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's a library for methods for distributing .NET and F-sharp, dynamically generated F-sharp code. Okay, so I'll finish up there just to say that a theme which I think we, I hope we can all think about over the coming years, that false opposites are worth struggling over. You can find resolutions of them some of the time. Maybe not Emacs VI, but you can perhaps find other resolutions set between enterprise and openness, for example. It's one of the things we all struggle with. Uh, and the synthesis is so valuable and productive when found. Uh, 
obviously you don't just want to kind of get the worst of both worlds, you have to have simplicity and unity as part of the solution. And uh, struggling with these things can be a load of, a load of fun as well. That can bring me back to Sydney after all this. <laughs> okay, so um, thanks very much. We'll take questions.